All right, welcome to Christian Bible Chapel by way of YouTube and by way of Facebook. And you that are live here at the uh, uh, church here, we thank and praise God. We are in the uh, Christology, Christology, and uh, I got my Sunday school notes up here instead of the Bible PowerPoint. <laughs> I was so studying and getting into the uh, uh, Bible uh, Sunday school, I forgot this is this is a little simple for God. <laughs> All right, we're dealing with Christology. We're going to talk about the death of Christ. As you see on the board, and later on, you that's going to look at either Facebook or YouTube and look at the uh, board here, we're, we're, we're faced with the ultimate question. The, the ultimate question, the two ultimate questions that we want to look out, look for, uh, look for in our study of Christology, the, the study of the and the work of Christ. Within that, we're looking at the death of Jesus Christ. Right? The death of Jesus Christ. The two questions we want to look at is why did Jesus, the Messiah, have to die? And the other question is, to whom did he die for? Whom did he die for? Those are the two questions we're going to be looking at. With that in mind, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come thanking you for our gathering together, those that are here and those that are far. We pray that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would guide us into the scriptures, the Holy Scriptures. Knowing that you are the author of the scriptures and you gave your Holy Scriptures to the Bible writers, Lord, help us to know the intent of the meaning of the scriptures from the writer's perspective, but not our own. Guide us through with your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of the word that we may know the intent, meaning, of the scriptures by the author, both the primary author who is the Holy Spirit and the secondary author who is the, uh, the writers of the scriptures. But these writers of the scriptures were moved by the primary author who is the Holy Spirit, and they were moved. We pray, Father, that you will lead us and guide us into the truth of thine word, O God. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, you, hello? All right. <laughs> okay, we thank and praise God. All right. Uh, okay. Well, are you still with us? Yeah. Oh, okay. That was you, huh, Shirley, that dropped off the scene, huh? <laughs> okay. Hold on. Let me, let me, let me, um, uh, oh, let's see, Shirley. Shirley. Yeah. Oh, okay. Are you still with us? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so let's look into the scriptures. We're going to look at, uh, the prophetic death of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, his sacrifice, his sacrificial death, his redemptive death, and his limited death. These are uh, four things that we want to look at while we are challenging ourselves to answer the the four questions. Yeah, in the four the two questions. I'm sorry. Uh, why did Jesus have to die? And whom did he die for? Right, so keep those in mind. So you might want to write those. Uh, uh, questions down. Why did why did Jesus the Messiah right, had to die? That's one question we're going to look at. Why did Jesus the Messiah had to die? And then the second question is to whom. 
did he die for? You would think, well, some would think, I answer that question, whom did he die for? I mean, he died for everybody. Well, we're going to look at that when we look at uh, uh, the scriptures, okay? Turn in your Bibles now <coughs> to Matthews chapter 27. Matthews chapter 27. And we're going to look at uh, verses... Let's see. 27. It's a lot of reading here, but we, we, it, it, it's, it's very important that we do read this. Right. Uh, and let's stop at, at verse 50. 27 to 50. I know on the board I have 56, but we're going to look at Matthew chapter 27. Verses 27 through 50. And while we are on, the, on writing it down, you may want to write down Luke chapter 23, verses 40 to 43, and John chapter 19. So that's Luke chapter 23 and John 19, if you want to add to your... We look first. We're going to look at the. Um, I, I, the sacrificial death of Jesus, which was prophesied by Isaiah the prophet, Psalm, the David Psalms 22, and and John the Baptist. All right. Now we're going to sort of look at his sacrifice, his sacrificial. His sacrificial atoning death. This sacrificial atoning death of Jesus Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled when Jesus came. So the Old Testament is prophetic as far as it uh, brought about the death of Jesus, the Messiah, wherein it was fulfilled when Christ came on the scene. So we're sort of going to look at the New Testament, Matthew 27, read that first, and then go back to the prophetic teachings of the Old Testament to show that this Jesus of Nazareth, who is the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. So in our reading, let's start at verse 27. Now, to... Bring it to pass, to bring it up to date here, bring it, bring the scriptures up. We want to see that Jesus was, and his disciples were in the garden of Gethsemane. And all, they was there praying, except for Judas who left and uh, went to betray the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. The chief priests, the elders, didn't know exactly how Jesus, who Jesus, what he looked like, because they all, see the disciples, they all look almost the same. You know, when you get a bunch of guys together, and they're, like, they're almost dressing the same way, and, and acting the same way, it was kind of hard to pinpoint the person, Jesus. And so, they needed someone to guide them to Jesus, where he was, and who he actually was. So when you combine the synoptic gospels together, you're going to see what I'm talking about in your reading. Okay? So, yeah. So, Judas led them to the point, to the place where Jesus and his disciples met to pray secludedly away from the people. Okay. In verse in in these verses here, verse twenty seven. Let's begin our reading. Here comes Jesus standing before the governor, governor which is Pontius Pilate. 
because the Jews could not crucify a person. They couldn't, they couldn't kill a person. They could try him and punish them, but not in the sense of actually killing and getting rid of a person. So this is the reason why they, it was needful for the high priest, the priests, and the elders to persuade the governor to kill Jesus. They had to. Okay. Pilate at this particular time was in trouble with Caesar anyway. Augustus Caesar. Or one of the Caesars. Okay, uh, no, probably Tiberius, well, one of the Caesars anyway. And uh, he was in the boiling water anyway because he had to keep the Palestine from being uproot with riots and, and, and fightings and everything. It was the hot spot of the, new, of, the, of the Middle East at that time. The Caesar at that time put Pilate in charge of it. And most likely, uh, Pilate probably was under investigation and being scrutinized by the Roman Senate, and they was probably going to try and get rid of him, which his wife didn't want to do. She liked that office of Pilate. So Pilate had to pay, play favoritism to the elders, the chief priests and the, and the priests, in order to keep everything calm down. At the same time, there was a certain individual who had a group of guys following him. His name was Barabbas, and he went about killing the Roman God, you know, the Roman soldiers. They caught Barabbas, the leader of the group, and put him in prison. Here comes the high priest, the chief priest, and all the other Jews saying, now put Jesus in prison because of what he, he is doing. He's saying he's the king of the Jews. And we had no king but Caesar. So Pilate had no, uh, uh, you know, he, he had to fall in line, keep everything in a peaceful movement. And that brings us to verse 27 when it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of, uh, of soldiers, 600 plus men. 600 plus men. Okay? Right. And uh, so here we have 600 some so men standing before uh, Jesus. Okay? And they're about to chase him. Okay, verse 26. Then the soldiers, verse 27, of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Verse 28. They stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they planted a crown of thorns and laid it on his head and a reed in his right hand, they bowed their knees before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. After they mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own clothing on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came, as they came, as they came, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come into a place called Golgotha, they said, that is to say, the place of the skull. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingle with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garment, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vestures did they cast lots. Now that's from Psalms 22. You see here on the board. The prophetic Psalms 22, okay? Verse 36. And sitting down, they watched Jesus and sat over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. 
Now let's let's make note of this. Uh, the prison that Jesus went to was not a common prison. Okay? It was the same prison that they put Paul in. It was the prison that the most deadliest, the most vicious criminals were put. I forgot the name of it. It's, I think it's Myrina. Mar, it's called the start with an M. Okay? And in this prison, you were shackled to the wall by chain, your foot and your arm and your neck was chained to make sure that you didn't get away. You was mistreated, terrible. You was whipped and beaten while you was there. You may have gotten water and food, water and bread, or whatever the case may be. Now the reason why Matthew is saying this in verse 37, because on the prison door, inside the prison, on the prison door, it was a plaque hanging on the prison door. So when the guards went there to see who was in the in there, it, it, it states the person's name on it and the reason why he was a criminal. He was put in prison. This is that same plaque that they nailed on the cross. This is his crime. That's why I got it here. The crime is, if you put all the synoptic gospels together, if you put Matthew's version, Luke and Mark's version together, you get the complete writing on that plaque. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So when the guards came to the door and looked in and pushed the you know, the, the thing over and looked in and saw Jesus in there, the plaque on, on the front of the door says, this is Jesus, King Jesus, the King of the Jews. Luke says, he added the word Nazareth. This is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. So Mark did the same thing. Right? This is the reason why verse 37, you see it in all caps here. Because that's the plaque that was put on the wall. This is the same, on the door, this is the same plaque that was nailed on the top of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now remember that in those days, from the prison itself to the place of execution, they took only the cross beam of the cross. You know the part that looks, you know, the flat, the flat part, the cross? That, you know, they didn't take a whole cross, like the whole cross, as the movie tells us. They only took the cross beam on their shoulders, and it was tied to their, to their, to that, and they dragged it. Okay? Now, that cross beam weighed over 90 to 100 pounds, and it was on their shoulders. That's why Jesus and anybody else stumbled and fell many times as it was weighing that cross beam of the cross from the prison to their place of execution. Now at the place of the execution, the, 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 the pole was already in the ground. It was a long, big pole in the ground. Like the telephone pole that, you know, okay? It was a couple of feet inside the ground already, waiting. They had ropes. If they tied the ropes, when the person got there, they were stripped of their outer, outer garments. Now remember now, while in prison, even before they got to prison, they was beaten. Once they got in jail, periodically the guards went in and whipped them anyway. Now, once they got to the site of the being crucified, they were stripped of their clothes, pushed down the ground, forced to stretch their arms out. Now, if, if, if a person's arm was not long enough to reach the hole where the nail's supposed to go in, their arms was pulled until it came out of the socket. And then it was nailed in the wrist, what we call the wrist, which the Romans called the hand. The hand, which we call the hand and the wrist, 
was considered in the Roman time a hand. Then the hand that rounded that round the, the midsection of the arm, the rope was tied. Then a couple of guys got together and held his feet together and put an arch under his foot, and they arched his leg up like a like a bow. And then they took a longer nail and took that particular nail and drew it through both of the feet to the, the block of wood. Then a couple of other soldiers tied the rope to both ends of the cross beam where the person is, the, the person is going to be crucified. And they pulled them up, pulled them up. At the same time, another soldier Two of them was on the ladder, so once the, 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 it was pulled up, they tied it, and they nailed it, and secured it. Wow. That was a lot that took place. And, and, and at the same time, Jesus and whoever else was crucified, they felt the pain. There were two, verse 38, there were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right side and another on the left. And they passed by, reviling him, wagging their heads, and saying, You that destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusts in God, let him deliver him now, if he will, for he says, I am the son of God. Verse 44. Then both thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast the same in their peace. In other words, they scourged Jesus also with words. Both these. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That's Hebrew, Latin, you know, okay. That is to say, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Again, Psalms 22. Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man calls for Elijah. You know, Elijah the prophet. Remember, in Malachi, Malachi the prophet prophesied that Elijah will come and deliver the children of Israel. This is in Malachi chapter 3, 4, okay? Well, chapter 4, yeah. When John the Baptist came, many thought that John the Baptist was Elijah, or, or that some thought that he was the, excuse me, the Messiah. Straight away, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, let him be. Let's see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus then cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his life. Of course, in your King James, it says the ghost. That's his life. Remember, no man takes my life. I have power to lay it down and I have power to pick it up. The word ghost here is life. His physical life was taken by himself. That itself proves that he is God. Nobody can take their own life. And I know some of you saying, well, he shot his head, he stabbed himself, but God is the ultimate one that decides whether they're going to die, even if they stab their heart. Verse 51, Behold, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints that which slept, arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection 
and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when now when the centurion and they that were with him, the centurion is the highest of all the gods there. He's the one in charge. When the centurion and they that was with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Now, you got to be careful with this because they didn't, don't, don't be taken in with the movies that they repented and they got saved, no. See, remember, Romans, especially a centurion, were hard-notched, powerful, strong men. And they believed in the gods. So the God that they are talking about, truly this was the Son of God. They really believed that this was either the Son of Hades, Zeus, or Aphrodite, or one of those gods. Truly this was one of those gods. Okay, It's not that they put faith in Christ. And many women which were beholding afar off, they followed Jesus from Galilee, ministered unto him, among them which was Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, the mother of Zebedee's children. Now, of course, if you keep on reading, that's when they asked Pilate for the body of Jesus, and they took him back. Now, it was important to read all of that. Okay, some some of, some may not even even read that before that that great limp, but that's the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Now, in order to explain, as I try to each time as I read this, we take a a, a, a look at the book of Psalms 22. So turn to Psalms 22 because Psalms 22 kept coming up in Matthew's chapter 27. So let's. Let's go and pinpoint that and see what it's, what it's talking about. Psalms 22. Any questions while we are returning there? Now, the crucifixion is the most divisive, hard-hearted, wicked form, mean form of execution. They meant to get to punish, to punish the criminal beyond his imagination and feeling. And that is exactly what the, the crucifixion did. When those, when those nails went through your body, foot and hand, it pierced the capillary, the arteries and veins and crushed the bones and penetrated the skin and it caused a nerve reckoning in your mind and, and a severe pain came about through the crucifixion. All right. Now, when a person was on the cross, remember when I said they took a block of wood and put it on his feet and pushed his legs up? On the cross, because you were dehydrated, because you was beaten so bad, you was beaten so bad that blood was just coming, just dripping from your body. They wanted to make sure that you died. But they wanted your death to be lingering. I read up on it how that estimate that it took some people 10 days to die on the cross. I mean, and, and see, you have to realize now that these birds and the heat was, was bothering you also. Your sweat and blood was coming down from your head and and, and, and it, it, it was it was it was horrible. Such a horrible death. Right. Now had Jesus been born in Babylon at that time, the fire was the way to get rid of your enemies. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember, they put in an oven of fire. Where in the Armenians, the Sumerians, each 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 empire or country had their own form of execution. The Romans devised the terrible act of crucifixion by means of crucifixion. Nobody else had that. Okay. In that perspective, in that 
and that and that man put it that way. Psalms 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See, there it is. Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my Lord? Now, even though this is a psalm of David in his moment of despair and, 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 and David feeling uh, abandoned by God, that's his, that's human, human flesh, human mind crying out to God. It is a prophetic utterance by the Messiah at his crucifixion. Why are you hard, hard, uh, far from helping me? From the words of my Lord, oh my God, I cried in the daytime, but you do not hear me. In the night season, you are silent, but you are holy, O oh you that inhabit the praises of Israel. Our fathers trust in you, they trusted, and you delivered them. Once again, here it is. Remember that high priest and him saying, he trusted in God. You know, I mean, let God deliver him. See, here we go again. Verse 5, they cried unto thee, and they were delivered. They trust in you, and were not confused. For I am a worm, a no man, a reproach of men, despised of the people. This is prophetic now. He was despised by men. We're going to get there, Isaiah 53. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. Didn't they do that at the cross? The priests, the high priests, the people, and even the two thieves. They shake their heads saying, he trusts on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him now, seeing he delight in him. Wow. Prophetic, right? But you are he that took me out of the womb. You did make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. And if you keep on reading here, look at verse 12. Many bulls have compassed me, the strong bulls of Bashan. What that is in verse 12 is the gathering of the people around the cross assailing and, 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 and throwing remarks at Jesus. It's just like, you know, like a bull getting ready to charge. He goes, oof, oof. He's, he's pushing his dirt under his hoofs and he's getting ready to charge. This is the same way people were doing at the cross. They gasp upon me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. I am poured out like a water, sweating, preposterous, at, on the cross. All my bones are out of joint. Now, do your homework. There, there's over 20-some joints in your body. And, and Jesus, when, he, when a person is crucified, you're, you, are little, you're, you are just like a piece of jello meat on the cross because everything is out of whack. Your bone, your joint, your bones. Um, my strength is dried up like a posture, verse 15. My tongue cleaved to my jaws. You have brought me into the uh, into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The extremity of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. It is wow. It's amazing, isn't it? Now, David, in his mentality, in his mind, because of his, it, it, he was greatly in depressed. Now, whether this was the time that his son Absalom chased him out of Jerusalem and, and he hid himself, or it could have been when Saul, year after year, was hunting David, and David had to hide in caves and stuff like that. I really don't know. But David, some point in his life, was really depressed and down. And he called upon the Lord, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So that's Psalms 22. Let's go to Isaiah 50, 52. Turn your Bibles over. A couple of uh, books over to Isaiah 53. Now, we already studied the deity of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, and we already established in the book of Isaiah that he is the Messiah, that he is God. Even Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, tells us that Christ, the Messiah, when he comes, 
Remember that prophecy, 70 weeks of his harvest? In Isaiah chapter 53, we see not only there, but the prophetic coming of John the Baptist in Isaiah chapter 40, proclaiming this in chapter 53, as well as Malachi chapter 3. Here is Isaiah 53. Now the question is going to come up, whom did God die for? Whom did God die for? I said the word God is Jesus, right? Because God cannot die, but in flesh he did die. Whom did Jesus die for? We're going to answer that question also as we look once again from Matthew 27 as it aligns itself with Isaiah 53 in the manner in which the Messiah died for his people. Isaiah 53 and 1. Who have believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. Now, before you even go to verse 2 and following, you got to get understanding of verse 1. Many of the children of Israel refused to, re to, 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 to uh, accept the coming of the true Messiah. It's, it's, the pattern is the same today. This is the reason why we got false prophets, false ministry, because they don't believe in, a, in Jesus Christ. They don't believe in, a, in the coming of Jesus Christ because of what they're doing. I'm going to get rich off of this. I'm going to get wealthy. I'm going to get take them all down. I want. And during the time of Israel, they're faced with the, the, the religious crowd, the political crowd, the social crowd, the governmental crowd. And, and and Israel is taking in. They're being very deceived by false prophets. See, there's all see. There's always going to be in a in, in a political system of government. A political system of government always needs a religious backup because they know people are highly religious. So they need a backup, they need a prophet, they need some spiritual advisor, they need a chaplain, they need a minister. It's all the case. And you check, not only in a democratic society, but in communist or any other uh, society, they always have a religious partner or somebody religious hanging around in their corridors so they can call and ask for advice. This is the same message that John is talking about in Revelation chapter 13 when he says the two beasts, political beasts, the religious beasts. Right? Who had believed our report? The report is that Jehovah God is going to come in flesh and restore Israel and bless her and save her. That's the gospel. But that report also involves that he's going to have to die as a man. He's going to be born of a virgin, suffer and die on the cross. God, Emmanuel, yes, yes, that's the report. Isaiah says, who is going to believe this? Just like we're faced today. Who is believing our gospel? That's the report. Who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord? See, when you, when you, when you, it's a human, it's, it's, it's a Hebrew metaphor, arm of the Lord, with a mighty arm and a stretched out hand. See that? I will deliver you. So the arm of the Lord is the power of God's deliverance towards his people. So the prophet says, well, who's going to believe this gospel? Who's going to believe the report? And whom is God going to share this with and deliver? Because everybody's not going to be delivered. They don't, not everybody. So in the first part of this verse, it tells you about salvation, 
why did Christ die? Right? And, 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 it, and it's going to show you who is going to get saved, redeemed, delivered. Let's read. Verse 2. Yeah. No, no, no. Mm -mm. No, this is different. This is different. Yeah, this is different. No, this is different. This, this, is, this is the gospel report that Jehovah God. See, remember now, remember following the pattern of the teaching from the deity of Jesus Christ. The virgin birth. The report is that the deity, God himself, will become a man, Emmanuel, wonderful, counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. He will be born in Bethlehem of Judea, Micah 5. He will come, Isaiah, from the womb of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. Unto us a son is given. So this is the report that he's going to come and die. He's going to be born, live, and die a death, a supernatural death, for the sins of people. Now, Isaiah is saying, who is going to believe this? And then Isaiah's second point is, to whom God is going to deliver with his mighty power, the arm of the Lord, and to whom the arm of the Lord is revealed. He shall grow up before him, verse 2, as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should des uh, desire him. Verse 3, he is despised, rejected of men. Now we're talking about God, Emmanuel now. So you have to piece all that teaching, the incarnation of Jesus, the deity of Jesus, the virgin birth of Jesus. Now here it is, the death of Jesus. But who is Jesus? It's Yeshua. Yeshua who? The Messiah. The Messiah, the anointed one, the anointed one, Jehovah God. So if God as man is going to face this horrible death in order to redeem man back to God, back to himself. He is despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we appreciated him not. Surely, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, periodically, in these verses, you're going to pull out over here, you're going to pull out some words, you're going to see our, many, us, my people. Why? Because it's pinpointing a limited atonement. It's, it's, it's pointing to a limited atonement. It's not an unlimited. It's a difference. Unlimited means that unlimited means that Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died for everyone. No person, quote, quote, is going to hell. Everybody's going to heaven. That's what unlimited atonement teaches. The Bible does not teach that. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> well, throughout history, you know, um, as you check church history, you find out there's a lot of guys that believe in um, uh, unlimited atonement. And if you, 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 take, you take the fact like um, uh, Arian, Arian was an elder of the church in the second century, and he started teaching that and many others. So people do believe in unlimited atonement and they get it especially from John 3.16, you know, like the word world. They take it like everybody, you know. And that's and it's pre and it's pregnated, pre meted in churches today. You know, it's God loves you. Everybody God God God's got a plan for you. God is going to save you. God God loves you. And and that's that's unlimited atonement. When preachers preach that, that's what they mean is 
The salvation of God is unlimited. It, 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 the power of the blood of Jesus Christ is able to save everybody. And it's going to. But, but the gospel, that's why the gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be preached in its fullness and its accuracy in order for people to truly, truly be saved. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did exceed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we are gone, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord Jehovah laid on the Messiah. The iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. This is prophetic again in Matthew, earlier in chapter 27. Jesus stood before Pilate a couple of times, and Pilate didn't didn't say anything. Until Pilate opened his mouth and said, don't you know I have power to crucify you? Then Jesus opened his mouth and said, you have no power against me. All right? So, he did not say anything. It's just like a sheep. A sheep can look at the blaze coming, can look at the razor. A sheep would watch them will look back and see that they're cutting his skin off. He won't even do nothing. And even when he gets to the chopping block, a sheep just continues to say, bah, bah, and the axe come <coughs> and cut his head off. Or whatever the matter they're going to do. Okay? And that's how Jesus was. He didn't provoke. He didn't stare him up and down. He didn't fight. He didn't struggle. He didn't sack him. He didn't give him lip. The scripture says, here in this verse, that he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before a shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? He made his graves with the wicked. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. That's when, you know, he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Because he had done no violence, neither was there any deceit in his mouth. Verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When you had made his when you have made him an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and shall prolong his days in the pleasure of the Lord. Verse 11, he shall see the travail of himself and shall be satisfied by the knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their sins or iniquity. Therefore, Will I divide him a portion with the great? He shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he had poured out his self unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made transgression for us. Excuse me, transgression for the transgressors. Wow, us. So here you have Isaiah the prophet not only talking about the death of Jesus is prophetic, Isaiah 53, 
He also says that the death of Christ is sacrificial and atoning. He also sees in this scripture that the death of Christ is redemptive. And he also pulls out that the death of Christ is limited. So let's look at let's look at each one again, beginning now at the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. His sacrifice is redemptive. The word redemptive, the root word is redeem. Redeem, R-E-D-E-E-M, it's redeem. It means to purchase. There are three Greek words expressing uh, the word redeem. Uh, one word, the first word is agorazo. That's the Greek word, agorazo. It means to buy out, to buy out. It, it, it pictures you as a slave on the, on, on the platform being sold by your master in the marketplace. They're showing the people your gums, your legs, your chest, your, your throat, your head. If, if, if you can read or write, you, you say something, you write something. Because you on this, you on this flight, you're on the you 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 you're being marketed by your by your master. So that's agorazo. Now ex agorazo, which is the word e x in front of agorazo. Uh, the word how to spell it is a g o r a z o. That's agorazo. A G O R A Z O, Algarazo, to buy out, to buy out of the market as a slave. We're slave, we're slave to sin, slave to Satan, slave to the world. Ex Algarazo, the word ex means out, and it carries a more permanent, stronger meaning than Algarazo because the word ex in front of Algarazo means. You are bought out of the marketplace and you can never be sold again. That's what ex agorazo means. Now the, the third word is lutru. L-U-T-R-O-O. Lutru. That means to, to buy also. To buy out. To sell. These L U T-R-O-O, Lutru. Those three Greek words identify the redemptive work of Jesus Christ that through his death on the cross, he has redeemed us. He has redeemed us. He, his blood is the gold, is the money that brought us out of slavery, of sin, Satan, and the world. He has freed us. He has redeemed us. Okay. He has redeemed us. The scripture tells us in Galatians 3.13, let me read it here. In Galatians 3, that's before Ephesians, back in the New Testament. Now. In 3.13, it says, Christ has redeemed us. See the word? Amarazo. He has redeemed us. He has ex agorazo. He has lutru. Now, each one of the words has a particular meaning to it. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his shedding of blood, and without the shed, there must be blood shed as a sacrifice, because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Christ has redeemed us, Galatians 3.13, from the curse of the law. See, the law cursed us. The law shows us our sinfulness. It reveals to us that we are unrighteous, wicked, and evil. The law was a curse. The law demands you to die because you broke the law. It wasn't going to, there's no appeal. You can't go to the governor. You can't be let free. You, you can't be set free. You have to die because the wages of sin is death. And that's what the law says. But here comes Christ. 
He has redeemed us through his blood from the curse of the law being made free, being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. So this is one of the reasons why a, a true believer in Christ will never ever face being resold. We never ever face the punishment of death or any kind of judgment from God or face his wrath. There's no judgment to them that are in Christ. You have been set free. You'll never lose your salvation. You'll never, ever fall back into the clutches, the clutches of Satan, the sin, and the world because he has redeemed you and changed your heart and mind. You are here. You're sealed until the day of redemption. You are here. You can never be, you cannot, a true believer cannot be demon-possessed. A true believer cannot be hexed or cursed because you are in Christ. That's what's involved in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. It's powerful. It's effective. It's a, it's a typical, it's, it's, it's exactly of the Old Testament, because the, the Old Testament sacrifices could never take away sin. It, it only it, what the sacrifice in the Old Testament did was calm your nerves and give you a consciousness and clear your conscience a little bit. Hebrews chapter nine verse ten, but it can never save. Because if there's been a sacrifice that could save, there was no need for God to come and become a man and die as the supreme sacrifice. For what the law could not do, it was weak in the flesh. God sent forth his own son in the weakness of the flesh as a man to die in our stead. Let's look at a pivot point of this in Romans chapter 3. Turn there, our time is going. Uh, we're almost up to we got about, what twenty minutes here. Let's let's look at something in Romans chapter three. One of the teachings in our Sunday school, our discipleship class on Sunday, will be talking about justification, sanctification, salvation, and the chain of salvation here. So therefore, Romans chapter three is going to show us about the powerfulness the efficacy of the redemptive, atoning, sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 to 25. Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the works of the law, there shall no flesh be declared righteous in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See that? But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest. How was the righteousness of God manifest? Through Jesus Christ. That's what it means. The righteousness of God without the law is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets spoke of the manifestation of the righteousness of God in the coming of the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, who fulfilled the law of God, who lived the perfect sinless life, died and sacrificed his life, that if any would repent of their sins and trust Jesus as Savior, they will have eternal life. Look at verse 22. But even the, righteous, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, 
upon all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Having been declared righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now, this is, this is, is extraordinary here in verse 25. God saves sinners from himself. You need to be saved from God. I mean, you know, you, it's just like a, a parent saying, boy, you better get away from here before I, before I knock you out. I'll take you out. Get away. Leave. This is what God is pleading. He says, get saved. Save. Repent and get saved because I'm going to destroy you. But who's going to believe that report? And that's what the word propitiation means. Propitiation in this verse, according to the context that we're talking about, the sacrifice, the redemption of Jesus, it means to avert the wrath of God. Jesus Christ, Son of God, dying on the cross, averted the wrath of God, and it pleased the Father that he would not destroy all of his creation, that he will save some. Sound like, you know, Lord, if there's 40 in the city, will you not, will you save? Well, if it's 40 people in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll forgive them. Well, Lord, if it's 30, if it's 20, I'll save them. I'll save the city. Lord, even if it's 10, will you save the city? Jehovah said to Abraham, if there is ten in the city that believe, I will not. So the wrath of God is poured out upon sinners. But here comes Jesus making a covenant before the Father. He says, Father, I come down to do thine will. Hebrews chapter 10 explains that. Prepare me a body. This is Hebrews 10 now. Prepare me a body and I will go and sacrifice myself. If I sacrifice myself, will you save those that will repent of their sins? The Father says, yes. And that's what the Son. R.C. Sproul wrote a book, uh, a children's book called The Princess poison cup. It, it explains to the children in an animated manner in which the prince was told by the father that the people whom I created, the father says, the people whom I created has turned their back on me. I want to redeem them, but because they are so sinful, I can't, I hate sin. I cannot come down to them. I hate sin. So what he says to the prince, he says, Prince, if you go down and take this cup with you, and there's a poisonous, odorous liquid in a well, if you go and be so highly obedient and drink of that poisonous, odorous liquid, I promise you that I will save as many as trust from you. So here comes the prince with his guys with him, and he comes to this big pond of poison, odorous liquid. It stinks his nostril. It, it smelled horrible. It was hot and bitter. And he took the cup and put it 
in the liquid and you watch the boiling stunch, stench, the smellness of the liquid. He remembered his father saying, if you would drink that poisonous, odorous liquid, I will save them. The, the prince looked at the crowd and said, you really want to save these people? And so the prince took the cup to his mouth and, 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 and drank it. Immediately he grasped his, he grasped his throat because it was burning and burning. He gasped and gasped and fell on and died. All of a sudden, the, the man cloaked in a black cloak came and says, Hooray, hooray, the king, the king's son is dead. You know, it sounded like the wicked witch, you know, ding dong, the wicked witch. You know, this is what Satan was doing, that he says the king's son is dead. Then all of a sudden, in the movie, how that they heard footsteps, boom, boom, boom. And then the wicked man in the black coat and some of the people saying, run, run, here comes the king, the king's, the son of the king, he's coming, he's coming. And here comes the father. He grabs hold of the prince who died by the water and he picked him up and raised him from the dead. The glory of God sweep through the whole countryside. And as many as received that glory by faith through repentance and trust in them, the sin fell off. And they began to love and obey God. Such a extraordinary movie. Uh, it was made out of a movie. It was a book written by R.C. Sproul. It pictures that here concerning propitiation to avert the wrath of God. God is angry with the wicked every day. Psalm 7, 11 says this. God is angry. He is so, he is furious. He is totally furious, disappointed with man. But he must punish sin. He cannot let sin go just rampant and just, just not be punished. Because the wages of sin is death. He must come and punish sin. And he did it through his son. But those who reject his son must pay the ultimate punishment, which is the second death. Now, man, yeah. Uh-huh. Psalms, Psalms 22, what, what we, we spoke of Psalms 22. The one you just said. Oh, no, that was the, the uh, animated movie, children's book. Yeah, I, it's, it's, oh, yeah you okay. can go on YouTube. Matter of fact, you can go on YouTube and type in Prince's Poison Cup, and it'll come up, and you can watch it with the, with the kids. Okay. Prince's, the Prince's Poison Cup, all right? So, uh... So the death of Jesus pleased the Father greatly. Right? And this is the gospel which we must preach. Now, uh, to, to close this, we look at one more point here because we say that the sacrificial, prophetic, redemptive death of Jesus is limited, which we already saw in Scripture in Isaiah 63 where it says, Cruci you know, us and the many. Now, to prove that point, uh, which a lot of people, they look at scriptures, and they say, well, it, 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 it doesn't mean that. But turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to give you two, two, three passages of scripture. So put your fingers in it. Matthew 20 and verse 28. Matthew 20 and 28 lines up with 1st Timothy chapter uh, 2 uh, verse 5 and 6 that's Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 let's look at that first Matthew's the gospel of Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 
it says that even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, the word minister means serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now the word ransom is the same as the word redeem. The meaning is, is, is the same. To give his life a ransom for many. See that word for many. Not for all, but for many. Now you know what many means, right? It means that someone is, is, is left out. Not for all, right? First Timothy chapter two. Now this particular scripture in Timothy, if you don't read according to the context and understand the doctrine of the teaching of limited atonement or the question, whom did Christ die for? We see here in First Timothy chapter two, it says who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And some look at this, but they, they fail to understand the word will. Who will. See, God has a direct will, and then he has a will that, that he wants all to be saved, but all will not be saved. And he knew he knows this. It's called predestination. Who will have all men to be saved? All men is the will of God for those who are chosen and elect. They will be saved. It's the same in Second Peter chapter three when it says that it's not the Lord's will for any should perish. All should come to repentance. So don't be confused that this this phrase means all men as everybody. That's not what the writer is, is speaking of. You have to stay in the context of the teaching here that uh, Paul is talking to Timothy about. The scripture cannot contradict itself. That all men here is all the elect, all the chosen, who will have all men, see here, who will save all men, who will, excuse me, who will have all men to be saved. The gender here is speaking, it's, 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 the Greek in the gender is speaking of the elect, the chosen, that all men. And that's why it is identified with second, with pit, first, you know, Peter chapter 3 verse 9. It is not the Lord's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's a misunderstanding of words, and we're using Greek grammar and understanding of the words, and we use, excuse me, we're using the English grammar understanding of the words instead of the Greek, which Paul is writing from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it is the job of the teacher and the elder in the church to preach this manner in which the scripture is relating in the intent of this context of the scripture. Verse 4 again says, Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Now, I think, this is, the, again, the all men is not all men, everybody in the world, but the all men is the chosen, the elect. For the final scripture, now it's, it's many scriptures, and but our time doesn't prevail us to look at all of them, but look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as we see here, verses 16 to 21, and that will close out. Um, our subject here. I got on the board here, 16 to uh, 21. It should be 14. 
And that's where we want to start. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse fourteen. For the love of Christ constrains us. Now remember the text, the us. Like in, that, in Isaiah, us, the elect, the chosen. For the love, see the text talks about believers in Second Corinthians. Even in verse 1, it speaks of believers that when we die, we await for the coming of the Lord so we can get our resurrected body, which we will get and become immortal, incorruptible before the sight of Jesus. Our bodies will be fashioned like unto his body. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. Okay? Paul picks it up, still talking about the us, the church, the believer, the elect, the chosen. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. Now, be careful in Paul's wording here because you got to understand because do not take this once again as in 1 Timothy 2 and 4 and Peter 3 and 9. The all is the elect. And it's going to prove it. Watch it. Let me read it again. For the love of Christ has constrained us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. All right? if he, if, since Christ died for those whom the Father has given him, John chapter 17, the elect, the chosen, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses, verse 3, the elect according to the full knowledge of God, okay? He died for all, then we're all dead. See, we were dead in trespasses and sin. We walked according to the course of this world, Ephesians chapter 2. We were just like anyone else. We were dead, unsaved. But God, who is rich in his mercy, wherein he loved us, he saved us. Look at verse 15. And that he died for all, it, watch this now. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. See, I mean, the scriptures explains itself. I mean, it, 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 it explains who the all are, who he died for. If you read it very slowly, cautiously, and observe what Paul is saying, when Jesus died on the cross, verse 14, he died for all, the elect, the chosen. But now, even if you don't want to believe in election or being chosen, you still insist that that word all means everybody. Just like you say in John 3, 16, everybody, the world. Paul is going to magnificently to define the word all. Watch this. If one died for all, then we're all dead. Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which were lived should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. Verse 17. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, he is a new creation. And all things, verse 18, are of God, who have reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ, and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world. Paul is using the word world instead of us now. Unto himself. But who is the world? Keep reading. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Who is the there? The world, the all, the them, the us. And have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, 
we pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For Christ, for God, excuse me, for God the Father has made Christ sin for us who knew no sin, that is Christ, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, if, 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 if we study the scriptures and, and, and stop reading it so hastily and fast and taking a, a school of thought or, an, or, or a denomination or a church meaning for it, instead of reading what the scripture says on its, in its context very slowly, you get to understand. And, and you see here, you... You really do, in this particular scripture, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it, it, it's really not a, a great need to understand Greek because it's right there, even in the English. And, and God marvelously, the God the Holy Spirit marvelously allowed the apostle to write it this way and notice here, you find that the translator of the King James of the of the English language, the Holy Spirit made it so that it's so simplified even in the reading of the English language. It's it's right there. It's and it's so tight. The word. All right. So that that the death of Jesus Christ. I know we didn't talk about all, but we read in Matthew chapter 27, Luke chapter 23, uh, and Mark gospel uh, 15, and, and, and John chapter 19 about the death of Jesus Christ. It is sacrificial. It was prophetically prophesied by the prophets. Many, all, all the prophets spoke of it. We just pulled out Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, and even the words of John the Baptist, Behold, the Lamb of God that came into the world to take away the sins of the world. Wow. Okay? Then we move to how that, that same fact, how that same death of Jesus is redemptive. And we looked at it how Christ became a curse for us. He has redeemed us. And being redeemed, we looked at how he agorazo, ex agorazo, and lutri, how he has brought us out of the slave market never to be bought or owned by Satan's sin in the world again. You can't lose yourself. Satan can't get you back no more because you've been bought out of the slave market never to be sold as a slave anymore. When we look at how our the sacrifice, the death of Jesus Christ is limited, atoning. And we praise God for that. Praise God. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and his ascension, and that will close out the study of Christology. Right. Any questions before we close out for this evening? Again, you can go to your notes and read all the uh, fine print notes that we have in here with, but, and follow with the scriptures that we have on the board because they are within the notes as you read. All right. Okay, Sunday uh, school, as far as discipleship class, is uh, at, 10, at 10 o'clock this Sunday, early morning service. We, we closed out with the Lord's Supper, and we took the Lord's Supper this Sunday uh, in our 8.30 early service, and we're going to talk about the uh, creed, catechism, and confession, and begin a study on the creed, what are the creeds, what are the catechism, what are the confession. So what I did was I pulled out the Nicene and the Apostles' Creed. We're going to talk about that first and go through them. Then we're going to pull out the Westminster Shortest Catechism and then the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is going to take some months and months and months. So be with us this Sunday, amen, as we, uh, the Lord's Supper, if you're not in church or gather with someone, tune in on Facebook or YouTube uh, with us. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the, the truths of the word of God. Help us to continue to search the scriptures 
for a clear understanding of the word of God. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit continue to abide with us. Peace be unto us all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. God willing, we'll see you all Sunday. Good night. Good night.